wegen. Israel to God 
Israel was to be forever bound to God in love. From the youngest of their days, even to their maturity, God bent down and gave them food. Yes. Then God eased every burden that they experienced. Notice the love and the nurturing of God towards Israel that's portrayed in these first four verses. God is a loving and nurturing God. Yes, yes. Now put a pin here and let me point something out to you. This language of God being loving and nurturing is metaphoric because it speaks of God in human terms. God, who is infinite and eternal spirit, does not bend down and pick up in God's arms because God is a spirit. And God doesn't have arms. This is metaphorical language to describe God in human terms. Terms that would allow us to better understand the character of God. But here's what I want to point out to you. These characteristics of loving and nurturing are usually described of a mother and her child. <laughs> now, I, I, I have done this with both of my children, and at times I still continue to do it with Michael, but generally speaking, the, the relationship or the, the, the characteristics of loving and nurturing generally are spoken of between a mother and the child. Notice, God takes the child up in God's arms and holds the child. God binds the child to God with love. God gives the child food and eases all of the child's burdens. These are characteristics we would attribute to a mother in relationship to a child. But these characteristics are here attributed to God. It was the case in the days of the biblical writers, and it is even so now that we live in a male-dominated society. So we reflexively have been taught to speak of God as he. We don't even think or give consideration to the fact that we speak of God in male terms. But what I want to point out to you today is that if we study the Bible carefully, and particularly in the Old Testament, we can find almost as many analogies and metaphors to God as a mother as we can as a father. The Bible speaks of both. And I just wanted to point that out to you. In verses 1 through 4, God is a loving and nurturing mother. Yet her child, Israel, keeps making sacrifices to idols. With all of the love and the care that God took to bend down and take Israel up in God's arms, with all of the love and care that God showed toward Israel to bind Israel with ropes of love, with all of the love and the care that God showed Israel to ease all of Israel's burdens. Yes, yes. Israel responded not just by making sacrifices to idols, Israel rejected God's protection and instead sought protection from another. <laughs> that is what's heart-wrenching. Oh, to extend such love, mm -hmm. such nurturing, and such care for your child, mm -hmm. only for your child to reject that love and go out and seek it from another. This is what Israel does to God. Notice in verse 5, God says Israel will not return to the land of Egypt and Assyria will be his king. As I said earlier, 
Israel refused to accept the prophecy of Isaiah that Assyria was the hand of God, and instead Israel sought protection from Egypt. But in verse 5, it says that Israel will not return to Egypt, meaning that Israel will not be, excuse me, that Egypt will not become Israel's protection. Assyria, just as God intended, would be Israel's king. All of this is because Israel refused to repent. Instead of repenting, our text says that Israel was bent on turning from God. Because they were bent on turning from God, they can call on God on high, but God will not exalt them at all. Now, when I was studying scriptures for this week's sermons, it was these words in Hosea that drew me to this text. Though they call to him on high, he will not exalt them at all. Imagine calling on God and God refusing to answer. My Lord. Imagine seeking God and God not being there for you. Our image of God is that God answers every prayer and that God is always there when we call. However, Hosea says that God will not answer Israel when, God, when they call, and neither will God exalt or be there for them. And the reason that God will not answer or exalt them is because they were bent on turning from God. We have a conception that God is to our advantage, and, not, and that is not either according to the Bible or God's will for our lives. We always think of God as answering all of our prayers, even though in the 7th chapter of Jeremiah and the 16th verse, it says this, As for you, do not pray for these people. Do not offer a cry or a prayer on their behalf, and do not beg me, for I will not listen to you. We also have a conception of God as always being there for us, even though God said to Hosea, though they call, God would not exalt them. Imagine this. Just as Jeremiah was the prophet to Israel, imagine God telling me as your pastor, do not pray for these people. Do not offer a cry or a prayer on their behalf, and do not beg me, for I will not listen to you. Can you imagine that? How often do I receive requests each week for prayer? How often do you as members come to your pastor seeking prayers for various situations in your life. And certainly you should because I am the pastor. But imagine God saying to me, do not pray for these people. Do not offer a cry or a prayer on their behalf. And do not beg me for I will not listen to you. If God actually said that, we would think what a horrible thing that was. Mm -hmm. but the reason God said that to both Jeremiah and to Hosea is because instead of turning to God and repenting, the people were bent on turning away from God. God would say that to us today. It would be it would be because we are also bent on turning away from God. Amen. Reflexively, we might say that we aren't 
bent on turning away from God. In fact, our being here today and being here on most Sundays would show that we have turned to God. Believe that our coming to church shows our devotion to God. But I want to remind you that Israel went to church too. Amen. Yet God still told Hosea that when they called to God on high, he would not answer. See, the question is not whether the people did or did not go to church. The question is, what did they do the other six days of the week? Amen. All right, all right, all right. Here's what they did. They committed idolatry. Generally speaking, our conception of idolatry is misconstrued. We think of idolatry as worshiping some kind of idol or image. Let's face it. Many of us, if not most of us, have seen that movie, The Ten Commandments, many times over. <laughs> and our image of an idol is that scene where they bring out the golden calf. <laughs> and because we have never worshipped the golden calf, we believe that we've never committed idolatry. <laughs> but that is not what idolatry is. Idolatry is defined as the exchange of the creator for the created. And whenever we exchange what is the creator God for something that is instead created, we have committed idolatry. That's, that's what the people did in Exodus. They exchanged the worship of God for a calf which they had created. Yes, yes. And the way in which we create adultery today is by exchanging our trust and devotion to God for the things of this world. My Lord. When Israel faced destruction from Assyria, they turned to Egypt instead of turning to God for protection. And then they went out and sacrificed to idols instead of turning to God. They sought protection from Assyria in every place and in everything except in turning to God. That's how Israel committed idolatry. And my concern today is whether we are committing idolatry too. Certainly. We find, when we find ourselves in difficult or tight situations, when, as the saying goes, we find our backs against the wall, right. in situations and circumstances wherein we are desperate and we have nowhere else to turn, certainly in those times we turn to God. Amen. And in those times, we can quote all of the verses from the Psalms that talk about how when they cried unto the Lord, he answered our prayers. And just as God did it for the Psalmist, we want God to do the same thing for us. We can turn to God in our most difficult and desperate situation. But that's not what I'm concerned about. I want to know what are we doing when everything is going well? Do we turn to God when things are good? During those days when things are going right, during those days when it seems that life is bright and everything is going our way, who do we turn to? Often we think things are going so well because of our own ingenuity. We made all the right decisions. We made all the right moves. And look how well things turned out. I just need to keep doing what I have been doing and everything will be fine. Oftentimes we'll go to our friends and talk about how great things are for us and they'll chime in with their two cents and 
tell us how to make things even better. And we'll take their advice because we trust our friends. If we need financial advice, we'll go to our banker or financial advisor and we'll follow whatever financial plan that they lay out for us and all will be going well. Yes, everything is bright and things are going well in our lives, but let me ask a question. During this time when things are going so well, are we still spending that quality time in quietness and stillness with God? Amen. Do we still pray and give time and quietness to listen to what God has to say for our lives? Right now. Do we continue to daily read and study God's Word? Amen. If we have slacked up or have not been consistent in keeping our daily time with God, but instead have listened to our own advice and followed our own way, then we have committed idolatry. Amen. If we have listen to our friends and other advisors instead of seeking God in our lives, then we have done exactly what Israel did. We have turned from God and sought that which God gives from another. And when we do that, we have committed idolatry. Idolatry is a very complicated thing. In the Old Testament, it centers around the worship of idols and images, and we focus on those idols and images instead of the significance of them. International Biblical Encyclopedia states that in the New Testament, idolatry came to mean not only the giving of any creature human creation, honor, and devotion that belong to God, but also the giving to any human desire and precedence over God's will. That giving a precedence means that any time you have given some human thing or desire, precedence or priority in your life, then you have committed idolatry. I think that movie with that golden calf and that image we carry in our minds has really messed us up. <laughs> For we have the wrong image and the wrong ideal of what idolatry is. Anytime we go to our friends instead of going to God, or even when we turn to our own selves instead of God, we're committing idolatry. Idolatry is far more complicated than just whether or not we bow down to some image. And it involves more than just our worship. Idolatry also involves our focus, our attention, our concentration. Whatever it is that draws our attention and our focus away from God toward anything else, that to which we give our focus and attention is idolatry. Mm -hmm. Understand that when we talk about idolatry, things really get complicated. But the rich man in our gospel story this morning also committed idolatry. Notice in the story, he doesn't worship a golden calf or any other image. He commits idolatry by worshiping himself. <laughs> William Willimon, in his commentary on the Luke passage, says this. The key problem posed by the parable seems to be how the rich man regards his riches. <laughs> his sequiloquy shows that he makes no connection between his good fortune and God's graciousness or his responsibility to that graciousness. Everything in the parable is sequilty. Only the rich man speaks, speaks to himself. And when you are this rich, 
you don't have to consult anyone, even God. You see, the rich man in the parable allowed his riches to turn his attention away from God. Amen. And in so doing, he congratulated himself and gave himself credit for his riches instead of God. Mm -hmm. This is idolatry because he turned and looked to himself instead of God. And he credited himself for his riches instead of God. But it's the turning to himself that I want to keep the focus on this morning. To turn our attention or to give priority in our lives to anything other than God is not to honor and reverence God in our lives. This is idolatry. God should always have priority in our lives and we should always turn to God for any and everything that we need. Amen. Amen. There's no one who can give better advice to God and no one else knows what's better and sees and knows what is ahead in our lives. Amen. Why would we turn to anyone other than God? The answer to that question seems so simple. But how often have we turned to others instead of God? Mm -hmm. Not only have we turned to others instead of God, we have also turned our attention away from God. Mm -hmm. Not only should God be the center of our lives, we should center every day around God. Man. How often do we let one day, a second day, three days go by without centering ourselves on God? My Lord. How often do we allow our busy schedules all the things that we have to do and all the things that we become involved in take priority and we place God's time to the rear. How mm -hmm. often do we fail to set aside in our day the quiet time that I've been talking about for more than a year that we need in order to have our lives centered on God? Amen. Amen. Whenever we move God out of the way so that we can do other things, we're not giving God the priority that God deserves in our life. Amen. And whenever we do that, we're committing idolatry to place anything ahead of, to turn our attention in any other direction, to give focus to anything other than God, is to commit adultery. I said that's complicated. But I want us to recognize and to understand one final thing as we approach communion. Even when we commit idolatry, God's anger will not, all, will not last always. Notice in verse 9, God says to Hosea, I will not vent the full fury of my anger. I will not turn back to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. The Holy One among you, I will not come in rage. Thank you, Lord. Because God is God. Because God is loving and nurturing. Mm -hmm. Because God had bound Israel with cords of love, even when they were bent on turning away from God. Mm -hmm. God was not angry long, for God's love overpowers and overcomes all of our sins. Mm 
Amen. If we would just recognize that we have turned away and have done wrong, we can remit God's anger in our lives and turn to God and receive God's Amen. love. Amen. 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 God is not angry long. Repentance remits anger. Repentance brings about love. Mm -hmm. That's why we come to this table to repent. Amen. To turn not away from God, but to turn back to God. Amen. Amen. To acknowledge that we have been bent on doing wrong all of these days, but now, Lord, receive me with your love. Yes. Yes. Amen. in love all the days of our life. Amen. 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 Amen.